Coming up on At the Forefront Live, cardiac surgery can be a very scary situation for most people. When we think of bypasses, valve repairs, and other cardiac diseases, we often think of significant surgery with long recovery periods, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Today on At the Forefront Live, we will look at robotic cardiac surgery and speak with one of the pioneers in the field. We'll also have a special guest on the program, a patient who has been through robotic cardiac surgery. She will tell us her incredible story. That's next on At the Forefront Live. And welcome to UChicago Medicine at the Forefront Live. This is your chance to ask our expert your questions by typing in the comment section. We'll get to as many as possible in the next half hour. Now remember this program does not take the place of an actual visit with your physician. Joining us today is an expert in the field of robotic cardiac surgery. Dr. Hassan Balki is a pioneer in the field of minimally invasive and robotic cardiac surgeries. We'll also have a special guest, Susan McClary. Susan just recently had a cardiac procedure done right here at UChicago Medicine. First of all, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks, Let's start off just with uh, some kind of some general information, Dr. Balky, if you can. What do you do with the, uh, what kind of uh, surgeries can you perform robotically, and uh, what's, the, uh, what's the big advantage to doing it that way? Well, that's a great question, Tim, uh, and thanks for hosting this today. Um, it's, uh, it's not well known uh, in, in the cardiology and cardiac surgery community, the, ap the actual number and variety of cases that can be done with the robot. Um, we can do everything from multivessel coronary bypass to repair of complex mitral valves and replacements to fixing uh, congenital uh, defects like atrial septal defects, all the way to taking out tumors, all done with the robot with small little incisions uh, in between the ribs. Um, another field that we've actually pioneered here at the University of Chicago is uh, the uh, procedure called pericardiectomy, which entails removing the sac that surrounds the heart uh, during um, uh, some infectious and inflammatory diseases, and that can all be done robotically as well. Now, it's interesting. We were talking a little bit before the program, the three of us, and, and, and I, I brought up a story I was telling you about my father, who had uh, multiple cardiac surgeries a uh, quarter of a century ago, 25, 26 years ago, but it was very different back then, and he was completely opened up. And I've, I've told him about what you do, and, and he is very jealous because he wishes he would have had to had the, the, the breastbone open. And that's a huge advantage to uh, the procedures that, that you perform. It, it makes it so much better for the patient. Indeed. It, it does. Uh, it, it makes for quicker recoveries. It eliminates a lot of the potential for complications uh, that can happen from opening up the breastbone. Um, and, and it makes for uh, earlier uh, return to normal activities and getting back to work, not to mention the psychological aspects of it. And this is something that we've noticed over the years uh, that I've been doing what we call sternal sparing heart surgery, is that the, um, there's a psychological impact from having your chest cut open. And uh, insofar as uh, there are procedures that can be done without that, I think there is a, a benefit. Obviously not every operation on the heart can be done that way. You can't do a heart transplant uh, that way. Uh, but uh, when you go to a specialized center like UChicago Medicine uh, that has the ability and the team and the resources to do that, it's definitely uh, better for the patient. Now, Susan, you've, uh, you had your procedure just a couple of weeks ago. Exactly, two weeks ago. So that's pretty incredible. You look great. Thank you. And tell us what, what you had done, first of all, and how did that go? I had a mitral valve um, episode. It was a problem with my mitral valve. We weren't really sure what the problem was until the doctor got in there. Um, and it went very well for me. Thank you. And, and you were, you, and again, we were chatting about this before the program. You, you mentioned that you were surprised with how quickly you actually were able to leave the hospital, how quickly you were up walking yes. around, and, and how great you felt. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was leaving the hospital less than 30 hours after I actually had the procedure. So I came into the hospital at 5.30 in the morning. I think I was in the operating room by 6.30, quarter to 7. And I woke up in the ICU at around 5. And the next morning, um, Brooke came in and said, hey, we think that maybe you could go home today. And I was elated. I mean, I actually felt so awesome. And uh, through the evening, the care in the ICU was amazing. They, um, they touched my heart. They knew what I was thinking. They knew where my, my discomforts were. And uh, I thought it was just awesome. And 
there I was leaving the hospital at 4.30 the next day. Now, Dr. Bonke, one of the things that uh, uh, Susan just mentioned that I thought was kind of interesting, when you get in and you take a look around, you can kind of explore and see exactly what's going on, what needs to be repaired, what doesn't need to be repaired. What, t talk to us a little bit about the procedure and what that entails. Yeah, so uh, mitral valve surgery is one of the uh, uh, more commonly performed procedures uh, using the Da Vinci robot, and it lends itself well to uh, being performed uh, with a very, very uh, minimally invasive approach using small incisions, the largest of which is barely half an inch uh, on the right side of the chest. And uh, in Susan's situation, we knew that her mitral valve was leaky, uh, secondary to a situation called degenerative uh, mitral valve disease. Um, but we didn't know exactly what we would find in terms of the reason for the leak or the, or the, the nuts and bolts of what needed to be fixed. And one of the things that we like to do with mitral valve repair is to repair it as opposed to replace it. And that's a, a relatively new thing in cardiac surgery uh, for about 20, 15 to 20 years. Prior to that, all we could do was replace the valve. And um, the robotic approach is uniquely positioned to be able to explore and evaluate and uh, examine every level of the mitral valve that we have. So the mitral valve, without going into a lot of technical detail, is uh, formed from flaps that basically come together when the valve needs to be closed. And this degenerative mitral valve disease, otherwise known as myxomatous degeneration, there are various names for it, uh, leads to a situation where the two flaps don't come together uh, perfectly well. And that can be because the cords that hold them are stretched or they're torn uh, or the, the frame that houses the two flaps is too uh, dilated and patulous and needs to be tightened up a little bit. And all of those things can be diagnosed very, very well with the robotic approach because we have a perfect 3D uh, super view uh, of, of the whole apparatus um, and, uh, and, and we can fix it. Yeah, that's one of those things. I wish we could show video of that. You can't really, it doesn't translate to video very well, but one time when, when I was in the OR with you and we were taking some shots, you invited me to put my head in the other side of the Da Vinci robot. And, it was amazing to see the, the, the three-dimensional aspect of it because it's, it's really quite stunning and quite clear and it, it allows you to kind of see where, well, exactly where you're going. It does, it does. One of the fallacies about minimally invasive surgery in particular uh, robotics is that you don't see as well. And as you witnessed in the uh, second console, we call it, or the, or the, uh, the uh, student's uh, uh, seat, if you will, in, yep. in, a, in a driving situation, what you could see is the fact that it was high def, it was uh, very magnified, it was three-dimensional, and, and it was perfect. And, and it's almost a better view than what you could get with the naked eye because of those things. Well, that's, I was just about ready to say that. I can't imagine you get a, getting a better view, to be real honest. You with can't you. get a closer view, that's yeah. for sure. Because, I mean, try, when we do surgery uh, the regular way, we have loops that magnify yep. two and a half times, mm -hmm. and we're sitting about this far away, so I'm operating on this cup like that. And imagine if I were to bring my eyeball straight down and I could evaluate every little bit of this U Chicago Medicine logo and I could look at every letter in a lot of detail and see the, the complexity of it uh, in the pixels, uh, it's really not afforded by, by um, you know, routine traditional surgery. And, and the machine is right there. We're showing some video of it right, right now. This is you uh, yeah. uh, performing a, a, an operation on someone. I believe it was a mitral valve repair, actually. I think that's what we shot. But uh, your hands are in the, the little uh, right, machines. Right. And it, it's a highly uh, engineered device that allows uh, the reproduction of the surgeon's hand motions uh, into the patient's body using very, very complicated um, uh, computerized connections. So basically, as you can see there, I'm moving these what we call joysticks uh, underneath the console. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a headset. I'm wearing a, uh, a two-way uh, kind of a walkie-talkie or, or um, uh, intercom communication uh, with the rest of the team because yeah. we really need to have very, very tight and, and accurate communications. So not only am I working a little bit remotely from them, but I'm also able to uh, communicate with them uh, uh, you know, quietly and, and, uh, and, and in a controlled manner. Uh, and that's fascinating as well, and I'll attest to that because I, you, you talk to each member of the team and you ask them very specific questions about all of the different things going on. And it does take a, a large team to do this. It's, yep. it's, it's, there's several people in the operating room that are working at the same time. Exactly. We're actually part of a, of a, of a study that looks at uh, interposing a machine in the middle of uh, a team in the operating room and uh, how that uh, affects people's behavior and how it affects their their um, uh, experience and, and, and their activities. 
Uh, and so it's very fascinating. I think what we've added, and I've been doing this now, I've been doing robotics since 2007, or just before 2007, but we've been using this system of communication for only about three years, and it really does change the demeanor of, of the team, and it changes you know, the ambiance of the room, yeah. and I think adds to a lot of the stability that, that we see. Now, Susan, I'm curious, with, with, in your situation, what were your symptoms uh, when you came to UChicago Medicine? How did that work? Well, I woke up one morning, crawled back in bed, and I had a very difficult time breathing, and my heart was racing. I tried to lay back down again, and I just felt almost as I was going to be drowned. So I didn't really say much about it to my husband that night. I just thought maybe this was a once in a time, once occasion. But the next night it happened again. So that's when I informed my husband, and within a few days I was at a general practitioner, mm -hmm. and he discovered that my blood pressure was quite high and put me on blood pressure medicine right away and sent me to a cardiologist, Dr. Reddy. And after I had a couple more tests, she's the one that suggested or informed me that I was going to have to have heart surgery. And she wasn't sure if it would be a repair or a replacement. But I started praying that it would be a repair because my symptoms kind of went away after the blood pressure medicine, most of them. I did have like a crackling sound I would hear when I would lay down, um, and that was still there. But um, then I was on foot looking for the, the possible surgeon, and she had made two suggestions. The one suggestion I, I followed up on and learned a lot in uh, talking to those, those doctors, but I, one of the doctors had actually mentioned that he had a colleague at this university hospital. And I followed up on that. I found Dr. Balki. This doctor sent a referral, and um, Elise set me up for an appointment at the beginning of January, and two weeks later I was in the operating room. You got a pretty good one, I think. Oh, my gosh. Well, <laughs> the minute my husband and I met him, when he walked out, we're going, okay, he's the man. Yeah. He's the man, <laughs> and this is the team. We just knew it. You know, you just can feel when you're in the right place yeah. at the right time. Well, I, I'm glad it went so well for you. And, and did, you, did you know much about the robotic um, surgery before you came here, or was that, that a learning process as well? I didn't know anything about robotic surgery until my cardiologist, Dr. Reddy, brought it up. Yeah. And then I found out that it is very highly specialized. And you just can't go to an insurance company or go to any types of doctors and ask for them to set you up with somebody or give you some referrals. So um, I, that's when I really realized how specialized this was and how important it was to find the right team. That's great. Yes. Well, we, we want to remind our viewers that we are taking questions, so type them in the comments section. We're already getting quite a few, so I want to get some of those uh, viewer questions. And the first one, I want to ask, it's, it's a statement than a question, but I want to make the statement. This patient looks awesome. I never would have guessed that she had heart surgery just two weeks ago. Is this a typical outcome for most patients with this type of, uh, type of issue? Um, well, you are correct. Uh, the person who wrote that question, she does look awesome. And, um, you know, make no mistake, she's, um, you know, she's still within two weeks of open heart surgery through a closed chest approach. So. Um, and yes, patients who come in uh, looking good usually uh, go out looking good, and, and the outcome is usually this good for patients who don't have a lot of other what we call comorbidities and a lot of other uh, medical illnesses. Obviously, you know, each patient has their own situation, but the majority of our patients are usually out of the hospital within the first couple of days after robotic heart surgery. That's fantastic. So here's another one. Had a stent uh, placed in in 2001. Um, should I worry about its age? Not if you're feeling great. <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy answer. Good. I like that. So, yeah, if you feel good, um, you know, but always talk to your talk physician. To your if, you have, so. if you do have uh, concerns, make sure you talk to your cardiologist. Um, I'm wondering what prevents robotic heart surgery from being the norm across all cardiac surgery is another one of our viewers' questions. I'm wondering the same thing, um, but we're working hard. There are many, many centers in the country right now that do robotic heart surgery. They do it in different ways. Our societies have started to actually uh, take up the, uh, the uh, uh, hard work of, of uh, creating uh, courses and symposia and workshop, we, workshops for, for people to train, teams to train. It's, a, it's a, a thing that basically is a learning curve. And heart surgery itself is not easy to do. And doing robotic heart surgery is also not easy, but we do it. And, uh, and I think that uh, slowly but surely, technology is catching up with our mindsets and we are starting to, to actually invoke some of this technology and, and we have a, a training program uh, at the University of Chicago Medicine but I'm also involved in national and international uh, societies that uh, 
uh, are involved in, in training surgeons and teams around the world, actually, uh, to do robotic surgery. So I think uh, it, it's a technology that's slowly uh, coming to, the, to fruition. And what you do is, is still specialized enough that you operate on patients from all over the world as, as well, don't you? This is true, yes. Uh, I was just uh, reviewing some films of a patient from Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, we have patients from Europe, from Middle East, but the majority of our patients are from the United States. I would say that uh, probably 50 to over 50 percent come from out of the state of Illinois. So, uh, Dr. Balki, what advances do you foresee or hope to see in the future of robotic cardiac surgery? I like that question. That's a good one. It's a good question. Um, I uh, foresee that the instrumentation is going to continue to get better. Uh, there are some operations that we can't do with uh, the robotic technology. I think one of the things that uh, robotic uh, systems are working on is what, something we call haptic feedback, which means the ability to actually feel the tissues that you're working with, which can add some dimension uh, to the procedure. Uh, although those of us who operate with a robot uh, frequently and, and do it every day, we've developed um, a feedback that's based on visual appreciation of, of what happens to the tissues. Um, but uh, the good news is that uh, there are many, many companies that are involved uh, in uh, uh, designing robots for medical use, and that's only going to benefit uh, patients uh, as we go along here. Susan, a question for you. Um, and this, this is a tough one, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm wondering if you had one thing about your robotic heart surgery experience that you would improve, what would that be? <laughs> oh, that and is maybe there isn't anything. Tough, I don't know. Yeah, maybe you went uh, as question. well as, as you could. You could, could um, yes. Well, I had a few little nightmares, but I don't think that we could improve on that. I think that <laughs> all depends on how, as a patient, you're coming across. I had a little problem re getting oxygen into my blood. So it took a little bit longer for me um, when I first came out of anesthetic. Um, but the nurses were there. They held my hand. They dried my eyes. They suctioned anything that needed to be taken care of and made me feel very secure. I ha never had any fear or any anxiety um, about what was happening to me. It was just a process I was going through. So your care post-surgery was, was pretty positive. Oh, yeah, it was. It was definitely very much so. And I don't know that I have any input as to what could be improved. Excellent. So here's a, uh, a question from a, a medical student. So uh, what would you say to young medical students who aspire to be heart surgeons and, uh, and even more to do the, the, the type of work that you do? You've got, you've got a fan apparently out there. <laughs> Good. Um, that's a great question. And um, I think that uh, we are, we're, we're, in the, we're always encouraging uh, medical students and residents to uh, adopt and, and uh, take on new technologies. Uh, um, first of all, somebody who's in medical school right now is interested in heart surgery, that's a plus right away because we're always trying to attract the uh, good uh, medical students to our specialty. Um, in terms of what to do to become a robotic heart surgeon, I think you have to go through the, um, the uh, training, obviously, and uh, continue to be involved uh, in uh, some of the advances and, and keep your eye on the ball. I would recommend that you do uh, some rotations, maybe do some uh, clinical attachments, uh, research projects uh, with uh, um, a robotic uh, surgeon uh, and attend some cases. I think all those things would uh, serve you well, um, but, uh, but great question. So interesting, so I, I do like that question because you trained obviously as a, as a surgeon right. and then robotics came around and how did, you, how did you get interested and get involved in that and then learn the, the procedures? Because a lot of this was a, a, a trail you had to blaze. A little bit, yeah. No, that's a great question. And, and my path to it is basically the uh, path of somebody who was drilled into me when I was a surgical resident uh, to respect human tissue and to not cut more than what you need to cut to see. And so my whole emphasis in doing cardiac surgery um, was to try to do it with the least possible invasion to the human body. And that led to minimally invasive surgery, uh, maybe two years into my practice. And then when I finally got my hands on a robot, I said, this is the ultimate, this is the highest form of minimally invasive surgery because it allows you to do all of the things that you can do with your hands without making big cuts. And uh, when, I, when I was able to finally convince my hospital, I was actually in practice in Milwaukee at the time, mm -hmm when I was able to convince the hospital I was working at uh, to uh, buy me one, and these things are not cheap. <laughs> I'm sure they're not. Um, it was, you know, the sky's the limit. And, and yeah. so I've, I've basically um, tried to invoke, every patient I see, 
I ask myself, can this situation be taken care of uh, robotically? Uh, obviously in a safe manner and without yeah. losing any of the efficacy of the, uh, of the care. Susan, another question from a viewer, and this one is uh, for you. Uh, was your heart diagnosis a surprise or had you struggled with any heart health issues uh, in the past? It was a shock. And it was even more of a shock once I took, started the blood pressure medicine and feeling good. I thought of every other thing that could be wrong yeah. with me at that point. Even I live on a lake, I was even considering, am I inhaling or absorbing algae from the lake? What, what could possibly be doing this? So when I went in after having some tests with um, my cardiologist and she said that you have a mitral valve prolapse and that it would need to be surgically fixed, she didn't know whether it would need to be replaced or fixed. Yeah. So um, yeah, I had to swallow a few tough pills and do a lot of soul searching and just become calm with this is who I am, this is what's happening, where do I go from here? And that little word that she said to me about robotics and I know of two surgeons, just never left me, yeah. and so I, we pursued that, and that's how I ended up here. I, I think it bears mentioning, actually, if sure. I could interject, absolutely, now, that we are in February, and February is um, Women's Heart Month, or maybe it's everybody's Heart Month, but to me, it's it's Women's Heart Month because I'm I'm very um, uh, interested in how heart disease affects women, and I think Susan's story is somewhat typical. Uh, it applies a little bit more to coronary disease, where symptoms are not expected and uh, a lot of women who have heart problems don't get diagnosed right away. I think we're improving and our track record is getting better, but it's not the same as men with, with uh, heart uh, yep. symptoms. And, and so I think this is a good opportunity to kind of bring that out um, uh, when talking about how Susan presented and, and what the, the symptoms were and, and, how, and how she got diagnosed. I think that's an excellent point and as an educational effort, it, women do need to listen to their, their bodies, and, and particularly if they are having what potentially could be cardiac uh, issues, don't go back to bed. <laughs> talk, to, talk to your physician and, and get it checked out because uh, it certainly will, will make a difference. Another question from a viewer, um, can you please touch upon cardiac tumors? And uh, is that something that you're able to uh, use the, the robot to help with? Absolutely. Uh, so cardiac tumors are, first of all, rare. Uh, the, the most common of the cardiac tumors are benign tumors uh, in, on the inside of the chambers. And we actually have a paper just out on a rare cardiac tumor that we uh, completely removed uh, using the robot. One of my um, uh, medical students uh, who's doing some research with us um, is, uh, wrote this paper and, and published it recently. It's, it's a, what we call a fibroelastoma, which is a benign, fibro, uh, benign tumor. And it was in a rare position in the heart, in the right ventricle. And uh, we have a series now of about 15 or 20 uh, over the last couple of years that we've done that we're putting together for a publication. So they're not common things, but they lend themselves very, very well uh, to being removed. Now, the other kind of tumor, which is the malignant tumor, uh, is extremely rare in the heart and those usually require a, uh, a bigger incision if one is going to do any kind of major surgery for that. So back to the mitral valve prolapse, do, do all patients um, need surgery? No, no, mitral valve prolapse is an extremely common condition. There are millions of people walking around with uh, the diagnosis mitral valve prolapse. Not all of them have a leaky valve and um, therefore not all of them need to have anything done for it. Um, uh, we do uh, uh, probably about 50,000 mitral valve surgeries a year, and um, the majority of those are myxomatous degeneration, similar to what Susan had, uh, and it is the, the technical term for what a mitral valve prolapse is. So the answer is no, not every patient with MVP needs to have it, uh, needs to have it taken care of, but if that mitral valve prolapse leads to a leak, then uh, they become a candidate for for it to be fixed. Uh, we grade the leaks as being mild, moderate, and severe, and if somebody has a severe leak in their mitral valve, then they are better off having it fixed uh, than not. Another question from a viewer. How have robotic heart surgeries changed since you started doing robotic uh, surgeries, and um, how have the procedures changed over time to produce greater benefit to the, to the patient, in your opinion? Well, the Da Vinci robot's been around, and this is just in, in my field in cardiac surgery. There's a lot of different other names of robots that are being used in orthopedics, uh, in 
uh, ear, nose, and throat surgery and, and a lot of the subspecialties. Uh, in my field, uh, this is probably the fifth, I think, or the, almost the sixth generation of robot that we have. And uh, they've continued to uh, become uh, better with better instruments, with smaller openings in between the ribs, uh, with um, more indications for different types of surgeries uh, to have a lesser uh, impact on the patient in terms of invasiveness. Uh, and just better visualization. Uh, one of the things that's happened over the last five years that we didn't have when I was training is something called simulation. And so now for a trainee to learn how to do robotics, they can be on a simulator similar to a pilot. Mm -hmm. And do, you know they can log 10,000 hours uh, before they even touch a patient. And so that has added a lot to the safety uh, of the uh, procedure and, and the learning of it. And how close is the simulation to the real thing? Uh, some are better than others. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I understand. Well, this is fantastic. And Susan, again, uh, you look great. Thank I'm you. I'm glad you feel well. I do. And Thank thanks you. for uh, thanks for taking your afternoon and coming over because you certainly didn't have to do this. We oh, appreciate it. Oh, it was it. my pleasure. I mean, I'm there for Dr. Bulky as he was there for me. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, anything you want to add? I, I know it's difficult. You're a busy guy, but uh, you can get an appointment as as you proved. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> yeah. that's good to know. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we're, uh, we're open for business. We're actually expanding our robotics program at the University of Chicago Medicine uh, so that we'll have, hopefully, the ability to um, have a second team, um, which is not always easy. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to uh, expand our, our um, uh, indications for the operation. Uh, and as I said, we're, we're getting patients from, from all over uh, looking for uh, a minimally invasive approach to their uh, cardiac problem. That's fantastic. That is all the time we have for At the Forefront Live today. Thanks to our guests for their participation in today's program, and thanks to you for watching and submitting questions. If you want more information about minimally invasive cardiac surgery, please visit our website at uchicagomedicine.org, or you can call 888-824-0200. Now, join us for our next At the Forefront Live. That's just tomorrow when we learn about women's health. We'll have three of our doctors on to discuss fibroids and endometriosis and treatments that are available for those that's Tuesday, February 5th. Also check out our Facebook page for future At The Forefront Live dates and subjects. Thanks for watching. Have a great week.